My name is Dalton L. Townsend, and I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee. Today is July 24, 2007, and uh, I am going to be interviewing uh, Justice E. Riley Anderson of Knoxville. This interview is taking place as a part of the Legal History Project of the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation and the Supreme Court Historical Society. Would you give us your full name uh, and address and uh, date of birth? My name is uh, Edward Riley Anderson. My date of birth is August 10th, 1932, and I live at 2233 Breakwater Drive, Knoxville, Tennessee. Justice Anderson, uh, you and I have known each other, uh, gosh, 35 years or so. Uh, Longer than we would both want to uh, say, uh, <laughs> probably. And, and I'm going to refer to you uh, as Justice uh, in this interview. But if I slip up and call you Riley, forgive me. But, uh, well, I'm, uh, I'll answer to anything. Okay. Uh, tell us, uh, I'm going to take you through your, your, your uh, early life and, uh, and uh, your upbringing, school, before we get to your, your, your law practice and then your career as an a, uh, appellate judge. Tell us where you were born. I was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And uh, you, uh, tell us about uh, your parents. Uh, well, my, my mother uh, was married, and we went to Chattanooga, Tennessee. My, my biological father was a University of Tennessee engineering student, and um, they were there for a fairly short time. I, I don't know, you know just how long, but I was born there. Uh, my father died uh, after about six months uh, in an automobile accident. And uh, at the same time, this was 1932 in the Depression, the Holston Valley Bank uh, failed. My mother had all of her uh, resources in that bank, and so she returned to Knoxville uh, needing employment. Um, and uh, I, of course, came back with her. I had an older brother who was a year and a half older, Joe. And uh, so she brought the two of us back here and I, I, I guess she stayed with relatives, I don't know, but she got a job at Eastern State Hospital. And uh, that job uh, did not have any provision for children. Uh, you got your, your room, a uh, single room, and you got bored there, and you were, she was working as a ward attendant. You worked 12 hours a day, and you worked seven days a week, and you got Sunday afternoons off, but not every Sunday. So we... Um, or kept by a friend of hers uh, named Money Hayes, uh, and she lived in the university area uh, on Laurel Avenue. Let and me interrupt you just a moment. What was your mother's name? Catherine Tillery Anderson. And your father's name? His name was Edward Everett. Okay. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. That's all right. Um, and so we, we lived with uh, Money Hayes, uh, I don't know how she got that. I suppose she gave us money at some time or another, how she got the nickname. But in any case, we lived with her for uh, four years, and uh, she began to take in other foster children as well. So uh, there were at times maybe 10 or 12 children there in that environment. And mother visited us on Sundays and took us down to the hospital on Sundays as she could. And then after a four-year period, uh, she uh, remarried uh, Carl Lester Anderson, who was my stepfather and who adopted us, my brother and I. And uh, she, for a couple of years or three years, uh, established a foster home herself so that they could have, have uh, she took in children and she could have a home where we could live. And that was in the university area on Highland Avenue and on Forest Avenue. And I went to Van Gilder School in the University of Tennessee area. And uh, then we moved down to Eastern State. Housing was provided for us there. There were about six houses on Eastern State property. Four of them were doctors. Um, and this is Eastern State Hospital, which was a mental hospital. Uh, 
located on Lionsview Pike in Knoxville. And uh, we got what was called the farmhouse. It was the worst of the six houses. And uh, that was before Fort Loudon Dam was built. Right, now, what, and, what year was this that you moved this back? This was uh, about, uh, it would be about 1938. And you would have been about six years old. Six years old, okay. maybe, maybe 39, because I went to Van Gilder for a year. Right. And um, <clears throat> so the dam was built, and, and the creek in our backyard all of a sudden became a lake. And so our undesirable house all of a sudden became very desirable. <laughs> but uh, we kept it uh, for all the years that we were there. And we were there up until about um, 1946. Okay. And uh, my stepfather and his went to join his brother in a propane butane gas business, and we moved to West Knoxville on Gleason Road. You say uh, the property became desirable because of the light being developed. Uh, uh, did you uh, enjoy the water? Is, uh, oh yes, we had a boat and um, interestingly enough the the patients at the hospital, uh, some of them were very talented and creative. They built wooden boats, sailboats, and, and uh, we had access to those. And so it really was a interesting experience and, and ever since, ever since um, that living on the lake at that time, uh, I've tried to be on the water somewhere. <laughs> uh, still have a boat? I still have a boat, yeah. All right, we're up to, uh, when I think you moved to Gleason Road. Yes. Is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, kind of the West Town area, for right. those who might not know. Yeah. Uh, behind West Town yeah. uh, Mall, as mm -hmm. it now uh, is. Uh, tell us, uh, uh, about your life uh, during that period. Okay. Uh, prior to that time, I went to Bearden School, Bearden Elementary School. Uh, Bearden was a grade 1 through 12 school. Uh, and as you and I mentioned, Bob Campbell was a student there when, when I was there. And uh, then I shifted to Farragut when we went out to Gleason Road. At that time, there wasn't um, any bus service or anything of that sort. If you wanted to go out that far, you bought a local ticket on a Greyhound bus, 25 cents. <laughs> Went to Nashville and it let you off at Gleason. And you walked about a mile to where our house was. So. Uh, Farragut is, was way out there. <laughs> Farragut was a long way out, uh, sure was. And so. how far did you actually live from Farragut? We lived a, a long way because um, Gleason, we were right um, at Gallagher View Road there, right. so it, it was a long way to Farragut, and actually it was reasonably close to the Bearden. It's close to that line where they, where um, they divided the schools. And how long did you go to Farragut? <clears throat> I went there for about three years. Uh, finished elementary school there and went to the first year of, of high school there, and it was a, again a, a grade one through twelve school. Agriculture was a required course. And I was there during the war and they had actually had victory gardens where the students worked in the garden. And I, I don't know what they did with the produce, but. Well, see, even, uh, even when I was growing up in the uh, uh, 50s and 60s, Farragut was uh, like a different place. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, it was, it was, uh, there was nothing between West Knoxville and Farragut mm -hmm. except farmland. Mm -hmm. If I recall, yeah. uh, things have changed. <laughs> uh, uh, so you finished your uh, your uh, freshman year at, at Farragut. At Farragut High School. And uh, during this time frame, uh, uh, were you working uh, uh, to help support yourself and your family? Uh, yes, yeah. uh, I, I <clears throat> did. Uh, we we had, of course, had paper routes. Uh, when we were, that was the first job that I remember that we had uh, at a very young age. And what paper did you service? It was the New Sentinel. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, and then we were journal carriers too because we carried in the morning. Got up about five o'clock in the morning and carried the journal. Both my brother and I. And uh, I think 
I may have mentioned to you in the past that I was a switchboard operator at Eastern State Hospital when I was 12 years old. Uh, my first real job, and um, I was terminated from that job because I couldn't stay awake. <laughs> well, what was your rate of pay? <laughs> I've forgotten. It wasn't much. <laughs> but I was a relief operator on the weekends, on uh, Saturdays and Sundays. And um, primarily what you served as was a security device for each of the wards. There were 12 wards on which patients were located. and the people who were supervising that ward would call in every hour. And so at 3 o'clock in the morning, all the lights would light up on the switchboard. And, and I would answer, and, you know, they were okay. But uh, some of the times I didn't answer. <laughs> so uh, that was, uh, I did that for about six months. And I worked in a grocery store, <clears throat> Dalton store at the end of Linesview Pike, just outside the hospital. And then I did farm work. While uh, your mother was uh, with Eastern State, uh, did you interact with the, uh, the patients very much? Yes, I did. There were there were a number of patients that were so-called trustees who were, you know, who were, were out in the community, weren't weren't in the wards, and and. Um, medicated and, and uh, you know, couldn't tell any different from, difference from them and anybody else. And uh, some of them would realize when they were going to have a bad spell and they would ask to go right. back in. So yeah, I had a lot of interaction with patients there. If I recall, during that time, or at least later, uh, Eastern State was a, a full service uh, psychiatric hospital. There were 2,500 patients there when, during that period of time. There were two physicians and the superintendent. And my mother, who started as a ward attendant, uh, ended up being in charge of their uh, new treatment facility uh, and uh, recreation and rehabilitation uh, before she left. Now, for those who don't know, uh, was this run by the state or, or it another run, entity? It was run by the state. Okay. I can recall uh, seeing padded sails there uh, yeah. when I was a youngster and visited it there. Uh, uh, okay, uh, when did your mother leave? Uh, she left the, the hospital in the, in the late 1940s when we were uh, close to going to college. and. Uh, she took her retirement and uh, be began the nursing home business. Okay. And uh, my brother, fortunately, got an appointment to Annapolis, and so there wasn't a lot of expense to help him go to, to uh, Annapolis. But, but uh, she was anticipating that she was going to need more funds. Uh. Okay. You, uh, after the first year at Farragut, where did you complete your high school education? I went to Central. High school. Did you, you and your, your mother move? We moved out on Broadway. She had a res started with a residential nursing home out there with about 20 patients. Uh, uh, what was the name of that nursing home? A Anderson Nursing Home. Okay. <laughs> Where was it on Broadway? It was in the Arlington area. Uh, near Fairmont? Yeah. Uh, right. Past Fairmont towards Fountain City. Right. Uh, uh, then she ultimately built a 100 bed nursing home on Broadway at that, in that area and began a chain of nursing homes with some partners. Okay, we'll come back to that in a moment. Yeah. Uh, uh, so you completed your three years at Central High School. Right. Uh, what do you recall about those three years? Uh, oh, it, was, it was interesting, a different kind of school. Uh, Fountain City was a fairly integrated place in terms of people generation, you know, after generation having lived there. I think it started in maybe the 20s and up to the 50s, so it was a settled place. But the other thing about it was that it was a, a good athletic school. Uh, it was also a good academic school, and uh, we, were, we were going there from West Knoxville. We traveled from West Knoxville to there because my mother thought it was the best academic school in the county. And you didn't have zoning then, so you could go anywhere in the county you wanted. 
So that's how we ended up at Central. Uh, that was quite a long distance to go. It was. Uh, you could catch the, the uh, streetcar or the bus uh, down Lineview Pike, come into Midtown, transfer, and go to Fountain City. What what uh, uh, what were some of your activities uh, and, and and likes in, in, in while you were at Central? Uh, I played basketball there up until that time. Uh, I hadn't been active in any sports. Uh, we pretty much worked after we got through the school on on the farm, and so um, we had sort of a truck farm. And uh, we weren't allowed to participate in athletics. So, but when we got to Central, I, I played basketball there. My brother played football. Had some great football teams, if mm -hmm. I recall. <clears throat> um, you graduated uh, in what year? 1950. Uh, and was your mother uh, well into the nursing home business at that time? Uh, she was just, just beginning it, really, maybe her first year or so. Okay. And did you go straight into college? I went straight to college. Ever consider going anywhere ex other than the University of Tennessee? Well, I didn't for economic reasons. Um, uh, I didn't really, until I got to graduate school, I didn't think about other schools other than the University of Tennessee. Right. Uh, but economics prevented us from considering anything other than living at home and going to UT. Uh, you, you mentioned your, your brother uh, uh, was accepted uh, uh, and attended Annapolis, right. the uh, Naval Academy. <coughs> uh, while we're talking about him, uh, uh, did he graduate from the Naval Academy? Yes, he did. And did he have a career in the Navy? Uh, he had a Navy? career in the Navy. He was in nuclear submarines, had command of a submarine. Which, which submarines uh, did he command? Uh, the USS Conger was one of them. It was, a, it was a, uh, not a nuclear submarine. I um, can't really rem remember the others. Good. Did he, uh, did he eventually retire? He, he actually went across the street. He worked in naval weapons and okay. uh, in torpedoes, and they went across the street and worked for a firm um, in Washington, D.C. that uh, was a naval weapons uh, contractor. And uh, he died about 10 years ago, lung cancer. Did, did he um, did he actually uh, complete his military career before transferring to a civilian job or yes he did okay. yeah he retired uh, he he had about 22 years in and he was a captain in the navy and uh, his children were about to go to college and so he uh, stopped retired and and went across the street. Uh, the captain in the Navy is equivalent of a, a full bird colonel in yes. uh, the Army. Yes. Okay. So he had a successful career. Mm -hmm. Did you keep touch with him in, in touch with him throughout the yes, years? Yes, he worked, uh, you know, he lived just outside Washington, D.C., and so we visited back and forth, and, uh, and uh, he had four children, and, and a couple of those are in Florida now, and so we, we have frequent contact with them. When you... Uh, uh, started uh, 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 at UT, um, did you live uh, uh, on campus or at home? Or? No, I lived at home. Okay. And that was where then? It was on Broadway okay. um, in the nursing home. Okay. Uh, uh, did you ever live on campus? Uh, I did uh, for a time when I was president of the fraternity. You were allowed free housing, and so for that year I was... Uh, I lived on campus. Are you, were you one of those who uh, obtained a degree before going to law school, or did you go three years and three years, as was the case I, for many in, people? In my case, I went four years and, and finished the degree because um, at that time the Korean War was going on, and I wanted to get a degree before I left. And uh, so I wasn't sure I would get back to law school. and so. Uh, I did finish in, in business and got a degree, then went to law school. Your, uh, what was your, your major in uh, undergraduate school? Uh, finance, business administration. Okay. And you graduated uh, from undergraduate what year? 
I graduated in 1954. Okay. Uh, I, I understand that that uh, you uh, became involved in campus politics somewhat. I did. And a graduate. I did, yeah. I was a political representative for uh, my fraternity, which was Phi Gamma Delta. You and I are fraternity brothers. Yes, we are. And uh, uh, I understand that you you. Uh, started a, uh, your, your friendship with several people as a result of I undergraduate did. school and, and made and some very close life. friends uh, in and out of the fraternity uh, beginning in those college years. Who, who uh, are some of those friends uh, with whom you've maintained uh, relationships? Uh, John Lockridge uh, is a longtime friend. Uh, we met uh, at the university. Hunter Cagle is another one. Uh, Tom Weiniger. Uh, Gene Switzer. Uh, of course, John and, and Hunter were, John's still practicing law, mm -hmm. and Hunter just retired. That's right. And uh, uh, Weininger passed away recently. Right. Gene Switzer was, was also a lawyer and was with a New York firm and ended up, uh, I think, in Savannah. Okay. And he's now deceased. Uh, I've been told that uh, uh, you were involved in the uh, running a cow for a, uh, in, uh, uh, in the Miss UT contest while under, under undergraduate. Uh, I did do that. <laughs> Why don't you tell us about that story? Okay. Uh, at that time, the, the fraternities and sororities pretty much dominated um, uh, at least political life and social life at, at the university and the independent students uh, uh, didn't have much interest or influence. And, and uh, campus activities. And um, the fraternities and sororities would organize themselves into political organizations, usually one you know, opposed to the other. And they would pass around the honors. One of the honors was Miss Tennessee. And uh, if you were in a sorority in a particular political organization, you'd get the honors on a priority basis and maybe didn't get Miss Tennessee, but you know, once every 10 years or so. Well, there was a member of the opposite political organization to us that uh, raided our political organization, offered uh, a sorority, uh, Miss Tennessee, much, much earlier than they otherwise would have gotten it. And so they jumped ship, went to the other side. And uh, that created a political imbalance. We had no chance to win any of the class offices, the president, the vice president or Miss Tennessee. So we decided we would run a cow for Miss Tennessee. I had looked up the rules and, and uh, there wasn't any requirement that you be a human being. There was no requirement that you be a University of Tennessee student. And so uh, we ran and of course we attracted the attention of the, of the independent students. We parked the cow in our front yard, which was the fraternity was on Cumberland Avenue, a very visible location. And uh, the cow was named Deborah Bovine. And, <laughs> and uh, of course, she won overwhelmingly. The independent students just loved it. And so it was a way for them to retaliate against the system, I suppose. But anyway, she won. And, um, and then they filed a challenge. And, and uh, they were successful with the challenge. Uh, we argued, of course, that the rules didn't prohibit that. But we lost. Okay. Did you ever have a sense that uh, any of the uh, women uh, students uh, took offense at uh, Well, I know, that? I know the ultimate Miss Tennessee took offense okay. <laughs> at it. This yeah. was probably a little different time, but. Quite a bit. Uh, did you enjoy your, uh, your, uh, your undergraduate uh, I did. years? Yeah, uh, I did, primarily because uh, of the fraternity and the associations that I had there, and it was a, a way of introduction to activity on campus as well as a social outlet. How did you enjoy your time as president of the fraternity? Uh, I enjoyed it. It was fun, yeah. There were a lot of competitions, you know, athletic and, and otherwise. Uh, there, were, there was competition among the journalistic enterprises, the 
Orange and White newspaper, uh, the Volunteer Annual. I was one of the editors of that annual, and, and a lot of other things. So there's a lot, of, lot to be involved in, and I had not been involved prior to that time to any extent. Uh, what uh, what uh, uh, made you think about going into law or going, attending law school? <clears throat> you know, when I when I was um, just starting college, I was going to going to go to engineering school as my brother had. I had an interest in math and liked it, and uh, had worked in construction projects, engineering projects, and liked that. So. I thought about being a civil engineer and, and sort of following my brother. And I got a ride uh, to the university on one of the first days I went uh, with a lawyer. I, there was a lot of hitchhiking in that days, and I was hitchhiking to school down on Linesview Pike. This fellow picked me up, and he started talking to me about career. And he, um, he impressed me with his, his passion for the law, and invited me to his office. I went to his office, and you know he talked to me some more. And so, I changed that first uh, week or so to pre-law, and never, never changed after that. You call who that lawyer was? I, I don't know who it was. Where was his office? Some, he worked. Um, I think he worked for the Testerman Group, uh, the real estate title company, but I don't recall his name. That's the family that. Uh, Kyle Testament. Kyle Testament and, 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 and John Testament. John, okay. Kyle was later mayor of Knoxville. Right. Uh, uh, and Kyle was a good friend, good friend of mine. The, uh, 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 was, it, was it difficult to uh, uh, be admitted to uh, the law school uh, in that time frame? Oh, no. No, oh, it was, um, you, had, you had to have a C average. Um, you did have a, and that's all, you did have a counseling session with, with uh, whoever was in charge of admissions at the law school who would uh, try to advise you or, or, you know, whether you might make it or not. But basically what they did was um, they admitted everyone who applied, who had that C average. There wasn't any LSAT then, and no admission test. And then they ran everybody off that they could in the first semester. So they would tell you when you, you know, the freshman class, one of the first lectures was, look to the right, look to the left, and neither one of those people will be there when you graduate. And that was about right. Our class was, uh, had about a 66% attrition rate. Uh, uh, were you on the quarter system then or semester? We were on quarter system. Uh, um, I also attended the university and I think we graduated about the same percentage uh, in, the, in the 60s, uh, about a third. It's changed. Uh, to go back to college years, I, I, I did tell you I was active in campus activities, but I also worked during that period of time. Uh, for, for two years I worked at Fulton Silfen, uh, 3 to 11 shift down okay. there. Um, and most of the rest of the time I, I had some sort of job or another uh, during my student times. Did you work during the school year? Yeah, uh, yeah, I worked the 3 uh, to 11 shift for two years. When did you find time to study with <laughs> working and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, being active and, uh, and well, campus? Well, yeah, late at night, different times. Uh, how did you enjoy your, uh, it's, your three years in law school? I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was fun. Did you go straight straight through, or did you? I went straight through. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, were you active uh, in, in activities uh, while in law school? I was active in the the bar association there and the legal fraternity. Uh, how'd you do in law school? I did reasonably well. Uh, you know, did you go in sort of the top ten percent? Be on law review or anything no, like that? I wasn't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't have the time to to do that. Will you, will you continue to work while in, in law school? Yes, I did. What kind of work did you do? Then? I worked at a mortuary. Uh, was a uh, attendant, funeral attendant. I uh, dug graves. I uh, 
What else did I do? I worked at the student center. I had another job too, but I can't. Okay. Escape me. <laughs> the uh, <clears throat> any uh, professors that you uh, uh, respected more than others, I should say, uh, mm -hmm. while in law school. Well, I thought uh, I, I thought they had a very good faculty at the university when I was there, but but there were people who stood out, and uh, Forrest Lacey was one of them, and. Uh, Professor Warner was another one. He later became dean of the law school. And uh, Dix Knoll was, a, was an eminent torts professor. He was a very fine academician. Um, probably wasn't as good a teacher as he was uh, an academic, but he was an outstanding He person. was. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> what, uh, what kind of courses did you like uh, in law school as opposed to others? Uh, <laughs> I liked torts. Okay. I enjoyed torts. Um, uh, I, I later became active in practice in real estate, but I can't say that I liked real estate that much <laughs> when I was in law school. Now, upon graduation, uh, 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 did you go uh, <clears throat> uh, in um, uh, straight to work? Yes, I did. I, I interviewed um, while I was in law school the last uh, last quarter and uh, ended up going to Oak Ridge. Uh, we didn't have any jobs in Knoxville to, to amount to anything at that time, and I, I really didn't want to end up in Knoxville, you know, where I'd grown up. I wanted to go somewhere away. And uh, so I went to Memphis and, and had a couple offers down there, but I ended up in Oak Ridge. And what year was, was this that you started your, your uh, it, it legal career? It was 1957 career? in August of that year. And what firm did you join? The firm was Wilson and Joyce. And, uh, and I was their first associate, with two lawyers in Oak Ridge. Now, Wilson and Joyce, uh, tell us who the Wilson was. Well, the Wilson was uh, Frank Wilson, who he, he went to Oak Ridge as a solo practitioner. I think at that time there were only two lawyers in Oak Ridge when he went, <laughs> and um, he had a little dorm room, was his first office there in 1946. And, uh, and then I joined the firm, and he encouraged Gene Joyce, who was a community activist, to go to law school, and he went to law school and graduated and joined Frank, and they became that firm, and I think they started the firm in 1952. Okay. And I joined them in 57. Uh, uh Wilson became Judge Wilson. He did in 1962. <clears throat> he was appointed by President Kennedy to a federal district judgeship in Chattanooga. I never had the uh, the uh, pleasure of, of, of being in front of him, but by all accounts, he was a, a great federal judge. I think he had that reputation <laughs> of, of being a federal judge. He was a great trial lawyer, too. I was his trial assistant for all the years uh, before he left. He was a really fine trial lawyer. Those who may not know, uh, what were some of his famous cases over which he presided uh, as a federal judge? Uh, well, the Hoffa case is the one that stands <coughs> out. Uh, there, was a, there was a prosecution of Hoffa for jury tampering, and it was moved to Chattanooga. The, the tampering actually took place in Nashville, as it turned out, uh, but it was moved to Chattanooga and tried there, and Hoffa was convicted there. Yep. That was a, I went down there for trial was about three weeks, and uh, Frank was, uh, uh, he was beleaguered by all sorts of motions and, and uh, isolated. He only had one law clerk, and so we went down for sort of moral support. But it was a very interesting thing to see 20 lawyers lined up behind Hoffa and his defendants, and, so, and a, a real show. Jim Neal was a prosecutor along with uh, John J. Hooker's father. So it was real uh, legal and political theater. <laughs> For those who, uh, the younger generation who may not know, who was Jimmy Hoffa? Jimmy Hoffa was a labor leader. Um, he was uh, a tough labor leader. Um, allegations that he was connected with 
the mob at different times. Um, and uh, he was just, it was the Teamsters that he was the leader of. Later on, uh, he, after he served prison time as a result of that conviction, uh, he was later uh, murdered, uh, for yes, those who don't know. Yes, he was. How long was uh, Judge Wilson on the federal bench, do you recall? I th I'm trying to think. He died when he was 65, okay. so he must have been there about, and I think he went, um, must have been there about 20 years. Okay. He turned, actually turned down a, a uh, nomination for the Sixth Circuit. He decided that he, 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 was, he was a real academic and a very intellectual man, but he decided he liked uh, the trial work better and didn't want to get isolated on the bench. Did you remain close to him while he? I did. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, you're, the other gentleman uh, uh, who was in that firm was Gene Joyce. Uh, I, I didn't know Gene, a fine man. Uh, tell us about him. Well, Gene was a, he was a very uh, energetic, uh, passionate sort of man. Um, very active, they called him Mr. Oak Ridge, very active in all community activities out there. And uh, as, was, as was Frank, both of them were, were heavily involved in, in Oak Ridge uh, community life and politics. And uh, I couldn't have had two better mentors to, to go to. I think uh, it's important to have that when you're a young lawyer and you're malleable and you're going to be influenced by whoever you associate with in practice. So I, I couldn't have been more fortunate in my choice of, of mentors. Uh, after uh, uh, Judge Wilson took the bench, the federal bench. Uh, what what did the, the firm name become? Uh, well, for a short time, Bill Wilson, who was his brother in Knoxville, came out and sort of helped with the transition. But it, then it became Joyce Anderson and Meredith. And uh, how long uh, did you stay with the firm? I was there almost thirty years. The two combined. Yes. So you practiced law almost thirty years. I did. And uh, after uh, the, the, the change in the name of the firm, uh, I understand uh, at the risk of leading, you, you were the managing partner for oh, most of those years. Oh, oh, oh. Having been a managing partner of the firm, was that, was that a difficult thing to do? Well, it is. It's, you know, it's, it's uh, handling personnel primarily. And uh, so it's, it's uh, somewhat difficult. And uh, it's also, managing the income of the firm and dealing with clients and, and recruiting clients. You, uh, what kind of work did you do uh, in your early years as, as a lawyer? <clears throat> well, the, the, the reason for my going to Oak Ridge was that at the time I, I went there, there was, was no city. Um, the federal government owned all the land. They had leased some of the land to churches, but primarily they owned it all. And so the Congress had passed a Disposal Legislation Act, which allowed the government to sell um, all, you know, all the houses in Oak Ridge and the commercial property. And so I went there really to help with that real estate boom that was going to occur, and it did. Were you in, involved in the uh politics of the uh, uh, Oak Ridge? Yes, I was. Uh, <clears throat> primarily what, uh, what Gene and Frank were interested in and what most Oak Ridges were interested in was uh, the income of the city from, from the federal government, both from the Department of Energy and, and the contractors at Oak Ridge, Union Carbide and Lockheed Martin Marietta and others. And uh, so the interest was in the, the senators and, and the congressmen for that district. And there was not much interest really in state government because the source of income for the town was, was uh, the government and its contractors. And so we devoted uh, a lot of time to campaigns for the Senate and, and for Congress. Um, Oak Ridge was an interesting town when I went there. There was 30,000 people. 
3,000 PhDs, and um, prime more more of the educated the PhDs, the graduate level, lived in Oak Ridge than than uh, perhaps the machinists or that sort of uh, grade of people. So it was a very interesting town, a very interesting contrast to outside uh, Oak Ridge, to Clinton and and the other uh, communities, which were more agriculturally oriented, and um, so it was an interesting place to practice because of that. For those who don't know, uh, where was the courthouse in Anderson County? Well, it was in Clinton. Clinton was the county seat. Right. And um, I'm going to talk about myself, but uh, yeah, I've been in juries there where, because you brought this up, where you might have seven or eight people with masters and in, in, in doctorate degrees, and the others might be. Uh, Farmers and and blue collar workers. That's so it was exactly interesting correct. juries we would have. Actually, correct. Yeah, very correct. Um, well, how did your how did your uh, your legal uh, career evolve uh, after you were initially in real estate type of uh, matters? Well, yes, uh, <clears throat> when we went there, when I went there, it was a beginning real estate practice, Rex and divorce. That was the practice. A little misdemeanor criminal work, and uh, as the town grew and the city incorporated the next year in 1958, uh, as the town grew, then there were newspapers, uh, radio stations, uh, banks, and uh, credit unions, and we were fortunate enough to represent banks, credit unions, uh, newspaper, hospital. You uh, we sort of grew up with the town. You, I know, represented the city of Oak Ridge for many years as its lawyer. Yes, we did. Uh, how, how, how long did you uh, do well, that? Well, they had a city attorney. In fact, uh, Eugene Joyce was their first city attorney. Uh, and after that time, they, you know, had a house counsel, and we did most of their litigation work. So we were you know, contract okay. counsel. And then I know later on, uh, for many years, you, you did a lot of medical malpractice work. I did. And who was your primary client? Uh, the uh, that Oak kind Ridge of... Hospital, the Methodist Hospital there. Okay. And how many years did you do that? Uh, probably 15 or 20. Uh, my recollection is uh, uh, that was uh, a major part of your work in your last few years. It was, it was. It was. Uh, I did uh, some asbestos work at that time, and did some arson defense, and did did a little plaintiff's personal injury. But that was that took a lot of my practice. Uh, how how did you enjoy the uh, defending the hospital in those malpractice cases? Uh, well, I like you know it was interesting work. Um, <clears throat> uh, more challenging, more demanding than some of the other parts of practice. Why was that? Well, it was, it was just a little more complicated. Uh, there are experts involved. Uh, the law was evolving then. We had the medical malpractice review boards uh, beginning. Uh, the hurdles were a little higher for plaintiffs to climb because of the legislation involved and where experts could come from. Um, um, so, some of those cases, if I recall, uh, and you've told me, uh, involved very serious uh, injuries. Uh, they did. So-called bad baby cases, yeah, we if had you will. Some baby cases. Were those particularly challenging? Uh, they were, yeah. It's uh, very sympathetic uh, situations. And did you actually try some of those to vote? I, I did try uh, two or three of those. Uh, they were long trials. Okay. Um, during this uh, uh, period when you were active uh, as a lawyer, uh, uh, I also understand you were active in, in the community. Uh, I was. Uh, in civic endeavors. Yeah. Tell us some of the act, uh, endeavors and that well, you're was involved. A, I was uh, <clears throat> a member of the um, Oak Ridge Charter Commission. Uh, we had a 12-person city council 
and it, it had occurred when the city was formed sort of a default because they couldn't agree on the number of people. Uh, so they ended up uh, choosing school districts, and there were 12 school districts, so they had 12 councilmen. So um, we were the first elected charter commission, and we were trying to reduce the size of council and and change it somewhat from from uh, all district to the combination of district and at large, and that's what we ended up recommending. And it was soundly defeated because labor was against it. So, so I learned uh, one of my first political lessons in that uh, charter commission. Uh, tell us some of the other activities in which you were involved. Uh, in I the was civic. involved in the uh, YMCA out there, as president of the YMCA. I was uh, head of the Mental Health Foundation. Uh, actually, I represented as one of my clients. I represented the uh, mental health center out there, the mental health hospital now. Okay. Um, and that came about, I, I suppose, because of my past uh, experience at Eastern State Hospital. And, uh, you know, I was in JC's, I was in um, all sorts of uh, civic activities, rotary. You're, you're, you're not telling us all the story, but you were in the, the Oak Ridge Community Art Center involved yes. in that, the uh, Chamber of Commerce. Yes. Uh, Board of Trustees of the First Methodist Church. Yes. Uh, and many others. Yes. Uh, very active in your community. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 were you, uh, it's no secret that you, you're a lifelong Democrat. None at all, no. Uh, uh, My mother was a, a yellow dog Democrat, so. Well, you've been accused of that, so. <laughs> uh, uh, did you? Well, I voted for a Republican, so I'm not completely yellow dog. Okay. <laughs> uh, did, uh, during your, your legal career, were you active in, in Democratic circles? Uh, I was. I sort of uh, waxed and waned. Uh, <clears throat> I would uh, get active in a political campaign, um, and uh, then they would pull me back to work. The first one that I actually managed was uh, Ross Bass in 1964. I managed a campaign for him. And uh, who was he running against? He was uh, running against Frank Clement. He was running for the United States Senate. He was a congressman in the 6th District prior to that time, and and he decided that uh, he wanted to run for the Senate. And, you know, as, as uh, background, we were interested in whoever wanted to run for the Senate, so I managed his campaign. How did that come out? Uh, he, he won against Clement in, in the uh, primary, ran in the general election against Howard Baker. He beat Howard Baker by 50,000 votes. Uh, the Clement machine and his machine had actually just split the Democratic Party down the center. And so um, in 1966, he ran against Clement again and, and lost in the primary. Then Clement ran against Baker and lost. What were some other campaigns in which you were involved? Well, I uh, said it waxed and waned. It waned for a while. Okay. They didn't let me, they put me back to work at the law firm. And so I didn't uh, manage any political campaigns until 1982. And what was that? That was a campaign for the United States Senate by Jim Sasser. That was his second campaign. What was your position in that campaign? I was a, a district manager. Uh, th these are, you know, uh, these are local positions right. that I was involved with. I was never a statewide campaign manager or anything like that. And then I, uh, I handled a, a district campaign for Al Gore against uh, Victor Ashe in 1984. Um, and then I did have a, a, a larger role in the campaign than, than district. And uh, then in 1986, um, I managed a campaign for Ned McWhorter for governor, okay. for our first foray into state politics. Uh, what what was it uh, about politics that intrigued you? Or, or, or 
I don't know. I just it was just to, to me it was um, it was an organizational challenge. Um, it was uh, a competition, a game of sorts, um, and it was just very exciting. You didn't know the outcome, and things could happen that were, you know, uh, you didn't expect come along. You had to react to them, and so it was just an interesting thing to do aside from your philosophical bent of how you felt about the candidate and obviously uh, before you agreed to work for them you had to they had to pass that test. You mentioned your mother was a uh, uh, strong Democrat. She was. Uh, and, and let's talk about her again and digress a moment. Uh, uh, we, we left her when she started this Nursing home nursing business home. Uh, years earlier. How, what did she do after that? Uh, she uh, <laughs> she was active in the in the uh, in geriatrics. She was a member of the first uh, went to the first White House conference on aging. She ultimately became president of the American Nursing Home Association. She was a lobbyist for nursing homes in the state legislature in Tennessee. She was very active in that field. How many, uh, you mentioned that she uh, formed a partnership with some others to form a string of nursing homes, is that, yes. is that the right terminology? Yes. Uh -huh. And how did that uh, develop? She, uh, <coughs> she was managing her own nursing home and she was active in a nursing home association and there was a, a doctor and a contractor in Memphis who were interested in starting a chain and, and they were attracted to her because she had worked with the legislature and also was knowledgeable, and so they, uh, she became a part of their partnership, and so they built a 100-bed home in Knoxville, and they built uh, two more in Tennessee, 100-bed homes, and then they began to expand to Arkansas, and uh, she had some differences with them over the administration. She was administ the administrator of the Knoxville home, the 100-bed home, uh, that involved what she thought uh, it was a services issue. Mm -hmm. she, she wanted more services for the patients and they wanted to make money. <laughs> so, so she fell out with them and, and uh, so when they were, she was a member of the, of the group and when they were expanding to Arkansas they needed her signature to, to expand there. They were going to build two more and she refused to, to do it and, uh, and of course there was, you know, you, yeah were on a uh, several million dollar loan and and I advised her to go ahead and do it. Well, you know, why don't you sign it? You can't pay it anyway. <laughs> so, you know, and uh, ultimately when you when you remove yourself from the firm, you'll, you'll have the benefits. You would not do it. And uh, so, um, so she left the firm and, and ultimately sold her stock. When did, did when she pass away? Uh, 1989. Okay. Um, she was 78. Okay. This is probably a, a good point to take a break, and uh, we'll, we'll take a break. Okay. Professor okay. Anderson, we're back on the record again right. after taking a break. Uh, uh, back to your, your law firm uh, years. Uh, uh, first of all, what was your starting salary? You remember when you started? Three hundred dollars a month. Okay. And uh, Jack Draper and I, in my our class, we were the highest paid. What What are your your some of your uh, recollections and and of uh, of being in that law firm? for all those years? What are you most proud of? Well, it, it had, um, I learned shortly after I got there what an outstanding reputation it had in the community and with other lawyers. And one of its, uh, one of its characteristics was a very strong work ethic. Uh, it was known for superb preparation of lawsuits, uh, uh, investigations, they would stand on the street corner about the same time an accident happened, you know, the next day and the next day and the next day and they just did exhaustive 
kind of work, and so they were known for that work ethic. And I used to tell the story about Frank Wilson. I worked with him most closely, and uh, we worked uh, every day of the week, and we worked Sunday afternoons. And the only reason we didn't work Sunday mornings is because he's religious. <laughs> he went to church. <laughs> And so for, for most of the time he was there, we worked that schedule, six and a half days a week. Uh, Gene was somewhat less, uh, but, you know, about a six-day week was normal there. Did you follow that uh, schedule uh, throughout most of your legal career? Well, I don't know that on Saturdays, <laughs> we would always be down there on Saturday morning. So it was, you know five and a half days a week and works in the afternoon sometimes and then if you had trials on Monday you work some on Sunday so you know. Okay. Let's talk about uh, Pandy for a while. Okay. Tell me uh, when you first met Pandy, your, your wife. Uh, I met her on a tennis court in Oak Ridge. And uh, you've been married how long to Pandy? We've been married 28 years. And what's her full name? What was her maiden name? It's, it's uh, Andrea uh, Anderson, and uh, Farmer was her maiden name. And what's her, uh, where was she from originally? She's from England. Okay. She was born in London during the London Blitz in the 40s, um, and uh, grew up in Cheshire. Her father was a very eminent nuclear scientist. He was, he was in charge of safety at reactors. Uh, for Great Britain and its territories, so and he traveled to Oak Ridge a lot, and that's so we saw a lot of him uh, there before he died. I know y'all have uh, recently uh, sold your lake house. We have, and yeah. uh, I'll come back to that then. But uh, and uh, where are you living now? Uh, what, we live out in River Sound. Uh, we live on Fort Loudon Lake in a, in a villa, yeah. limited lot line development. Now, how many children? Uh, uh, do you have? We have seven okay. uh, between us, um, and we have nine grandchildren. Okay. Where are your children? Uh, they're scattered around. Uh, uh, they're in Baltimore, in New York City, and uh, Arizona, Arkansas, Nashville, and Oak Ridge. Do you keep up with them? Uh, yeah, we do. We okay. do visit them often and they come to see us often. So. How about your grandchildren? We have only one that's local. One, uh, the youngest one who's two years old is in Oak Ridge and, and my son Blake's daughter. Okay. And uh, the next closest is Nashville, Sean is my grandson. And uh, Sean is, uh, maybe he's nine now. And um, my daughter, lives there. She's a lawyer there. The, uh, uh, at some point you, uh, you became a uh, appellate judge. Uh, tell us why you decided to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, seek uh, uh, become an appellate judge, and when it occurred? Uh, it, it occurred in uh, 1987, and it didn't really, I didn't really think about it that much, I don't think, uh, but there was a sudden resignation uh, by Judge Parrott, and uh, I had been thinking about cutting back somewhat in law practice and, uh, and or doing something else, just thinking about it, and uh, that opportunity came, and I decided that I'd like to do it, and uh, so I applied for it. Had you ever uh, sought public office before then? Nothing other than the Charter Commission, which was an elected position had citywide ever, in Oak Ridge. Had you ever thought about being a, a, a trial judge? I thought more about being a trial judge, uh, but there wasn't, you know, any opportunity. Uh, at that time, and so it just wasn't wasn't anything that came up. For those who might not know, uh, who was Judge Parrott? Judge Parrott was a, a judge on the uh, Court of Eastern Division of the Court of Appeals from from Strawberry Plains, Tennessee, just outside, just the east of Knoxville. 
Uh, tell us how, how the, uh, the, the system worked when you became a, an appellate uh, court appeals judge, how, how, uh, uh, how that worked at that time. I know okay. we've had different ways of becoming uh, appellate judges and it's changed over the years, but just tell us how that well, worked at, at that, that time. At that time, there was a, a statewide nominating commission composed of components of the political parties. In other words, there was a certain percentage of Republicans, a certain percentage of Democrats that had to be on the commission. And it was appointed by, primarily by the legislature. There may have been some other appointments. And, and there were selected groups that it had to come from, like the Bar Association and other, other groups. And uh, so they had this nominating commission, I've forgotten how many, probably 12 or so. Uh, and you applied and you had a hearing and uh, you had an interview with them and then they chose what they considered to be the top three. In my case, 14 applied because it had been 10 or 12 years since a new judge uh, had been on the court and uh, so a lot, a lot of people lined up. And I was fortunate enough to be in the top three. And then from that top three, the governor chooses one. Um, he, he can pass over and go to the other, you know, another time. But he chooses one, and fortunately he chose me. And so I went on the Court of Appeals. Uh, do you recall who the other two nominees were? Uh, Jimmy Baxter in, uh, from Knoxville. Um, was one of them, and there was a, a gentleman from Chattanooga who was a lawyer and had been a legislator, and I, his name escapes me. So those were the three. Jimmy Baxter, of course, was a federal attorney general. He was. A, mm -hmm. a assistant attorney general for mm -hmm. many years, and never retired, and uh, um, one of the most first successful uh, Afro-American mm -hmm. uh, lawyers in this area. Right. Uh, a very high, competent man. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, who, who was governor? Who, who was the governor who appointed you to that position? Uh, governor Ned McWhorter okay. appointed and th and th Again, this was what year? This was uh, March of 1987. Uh, and at that time, how many, uh, this was the eastern section, Court Yes. Field. How many uh, uh, judges were there on each, in each section? Uh, there were 12 judges total, four in each section, four in the middle, four in the west, okay. four in the east. Uh, later on became five. Uh, no, it, it had been three. It had been nine. Three okay. in the middle, three in the east, three in the west. It expanded in, in the late 70s to 12, and okay. it's still 12. Still 12, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and you recall who was on the bench with you when you first... Uh, Herschel Franks uh, was had been the most recent appointee, and he was appointed in sometime between '74 and '78. Houston Goddard uh, was appointed before that, um, and Cliff Sanders uh, was the third one, and he's from he was from Kingsport. Okay. What What are your uh, uh, Did you find it difficult? Uh, going straight from a trial practice uh, uh, to being an appellate judge. It was difficult in, the, in a personal sense. It was difficult because it was isolating. Your, your friendships with uh, lawyers were no longer the same, even, even close friends. Uh, it was different, and uh, you weren't as close. And certainly the camaraderie that you had with the bar, with lawyers, you, you didn't have any more. And you didn't have anything really to substitute for that on the Court of Appeals. You did on the Supreme Court, but you didn't on the Court of Appeals. And uh, I remained active in, in my community and so had an outlet there, but I, I didn't have an outlet uh, with the bar, who were my closest friends. Did you divorce yourself from them uh, or did it just happen naturally? Uh... Well, it, it was a little of both. Uh, they treated me differently, and uh, there were certain things, you know, that I couldn't do. Uh, I, I couldn't have a, a close association with one lawyer or another. Uh, if, I, if I did, I'd have to recuse myself on 
cases. So, uh, did you continue to socialize with your all your friends? Uh, I did to a very limited extent. Uh, to those that were closest to me, like John Lockridge, uh, I continued, and of course, if he ever had a case there, I would recuse myself. But, but uh, that's probably the only one. Uh, did you have to uh, submit yourself to any kind of training when you first uh, 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 started your work in the Court of Appeals? Well, the, the <clears throat> nationwide training uh, for appellate judges is at New York University. Now it's, uh, there's another competitor in Los, uh, you know, out, out in uh, Nevada. Um, which is more active with with trial judges, began with trial judges, but NYU was the training ground for, for appellate judges all over the country, and I went there. Uh, they usually wanted you to serve a year before you went, and I did that, and I went. And then I went back again uh, when I was on the Supreme Court to another graduate group. It's an advanced group. And then I became a part of their Institute of Judicial Administration there, and and, and still there. You have any, do you have any idea how many cases uh, or uh, opinions you wrote while uh, on the uh, court appeals? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, but but my guess is somewhere around 200. We our our workload was around 65 or 70 a year. So. I think, uh, you know, of, of major opinions that probably around 200. Okay. Uh, the, uh, you heard your, uh, your arguments at that time right behind our building here. Yes. In the now closed Court of Appeals, Supreme Court building. Right. Uh, uh, did you enjoy those years? Uh, is, is it I did. Uh, the, you know, the, the judges were close. Uh, I remember when, uh, I had to run for election. Of course, that was part of the part of the uh, plan, uh, election plan, is that you had to run for election in the next biennial. So I, I ran for election in '88, uh, a little more than a year later. And uh, that time, it was the tradition for court of appeals judges not to campaign. And so I talked to Joe Duncan, who was a judge on the court of criminal appeals, and to Houston Goddard. Uh, who was on the Court of Appeals, both of whom I was close to, about campaigning. And they said, no, you shouldn't do that. They said, you're going you're to get exactly the same amount of votes, uh, whether you do or not, and you might hurt yourself. So, of course, I didn't listen to them. I'm not good at that. <laughs> and um, I went ahead and campaigned, uh, primarily in East Tennessee. I probably visited about 25 counties and just went around, did a courthouse tour and that sort of thing. And, Sure enough, I got to just the same amount of votes as they did, <laughs> and they didn't, they didn't get out of their offices. For those uh, who might not know, uh, when you had to campaign in, in 1988, yes, uh, was was that against someone else, or were you just no, it was, was up or down vote? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm sorry I didn't explain the that. System it's a yes, years. no vote. Uh, okay. You ran against right. yourself essentially, and uh, you had to get more than 50 percent. Yeses, and if you didn't, uh, you you were out. That was the end of you. All right. Uh, and uh, you were on the court of appeals. Uh, how many years? From March of '87 to uh, September of '90, so a little more than three and a half, I guess. Uh, did you uh, did you ever miss the practice of law once you? I did. That position? I did. I missed uh, the people. I missed the association. Um, and to some extent, I, I miss uh, uh, the adversarial part of it, uh, you know, the competition uh, part of it. But um, primarily, it was the people I, I've heard described in, in the building that you refer to, which is across the street from where we are. You could walk down the hall, and you might see one person, or you might see nobody. And uh, that, of course, that's not true. And in the Anderson County Courthouse or the Knox County Courthouse. You're going to see a lot of people you know. And, and so it was very different. Well, in 1990, you uh, 
you uh, sorry uh, in 1990 you you uh, made a decision to uh, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, run for the Supreme Court right why don't you tell us uh, <clears throat> how the system worked at that time and and uh, and, uh, and uh, how you uh, ascended, became well, at that uh, Supreme time, Court Justice. At that time, it was a uh, popular election for the Supreme Court. The intermediate appellate courts, uh, the Court of Appeals, Court of Criminal Appeals, had the yes-no system. But the Supreme Court was still in popular election. Um, and so uh, you had to campaign for the Democratic or Republican Party nomination. In the Democratic uh, case, it was the Democratic Executive Committee that chose you. And they, the members were located all over the state in senatorial districts. And uh, I'm trying to think of the number. I think there were 64 uh, Executive Committee members. And so essentially you traveled all across the state to visit those members and, and uh, and tell them you were interested in your qualifications and, and see if you could get their vote. And so uh, I was running against um, an incumbent uh, Supreme Court Justice, Justice Cooper. And uh, we also, Herschel Franks was also in that race. Um, he was a Court of Appeals judge along with me. And um, so there were two of us running against him. And um, in January, they had the vote, uh, so we started campaigning, say, in, you know, in the fall, and had the vote, and I was fortunate enough to be selected. Uh, Herschel Franks had dropped out of the race uh, in, sometime in December, and so it was just between uh, Justice Cooper and I. Now, there was another <coughs> uh, contest, excuse me, <clears throat> by another, in another seat at that time, is that correct? That's right. Well, there, actually, there were three open seats. Uh, uh, there was another contested one against an incumbent, uh, Judge uh, Harbinson, who was an incumbent uh, uh, Supreme Court Justice, and uh, Sissy Daughtry, who was on the Court of Criminal Appeals for many years, was running against him. Okay. And uh, one of the things that had happened in the in the Democratic uh, primary, they changed the rules, I think, uh, back in the early 70s, which required that half of the Democratic Executive Committee people be women. And, uh, and so it was composed half women, half men. And uh, she ran and she won against Harbinson. And, uh, and what uh, about the third? Open the third seat was an open seat. Phones. Uh, uh, was an incumbent Supreme Court Justice, but he retired. And so that was an open seat, and uh, Lyle Reed won that seat, and there was opposition. I've forgotten who, but... Uh. Now, uh, so you're, you're, you're nominated or selected by the, the Democratic uh, uh, Party. Right. <clears throat> uh, and did you actually have a... a uh, a race against any Republicans. Uh, we didn't end up having one. Uh, one of the things <coughs> I should add is that the Democratic Party had a had a uh, merit commission, which uh, selected their candidates. There was competition to see who would be uh, who would be nominated before you know before we got to the, to the <coughs> stage where we were running against the incumbent, and so uh, there were perhaps. Uh, 12 or so that were veeing for these spots to, to oppose uh, the incumbent. And uh, so they had a merit commission that sort of wintered it down to the ones of us who did run. Uh, did you expect uh, to have to run against a Republican? Uh... I, ex I fully expected to because, uh, particularly in East Tennessee, the tradition had been that there was often Republican opposition uh, to the person from East Tennessee, that East Tennessee is Republican, and although it's a statewide race, uh, uh, Irma Greenwood, for example, ran from East Tennessee, and there have been other Republicans that have run from East Tennessee. 
So I did expect uh, opposition, but uh, as it turned out, there was a lot of talk, but, but no one uh, ended up running. Uh, so you became a Supreme Court Justice. I, I became a Supreme Court Justice. We actually uh, had planned a campaign, and so we did visit about 70 counties. The, 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 Supreme, the incumbent members of the Supreme Court, Frank DeRota and Charles O'Brien and, and the three new ones, and uh, we, we went to about 70 counties over that summer of 1990. And you were on the uh, Supreme Court how many years? Sixteen years. Okay. Recently retired. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when you uh, first started uh, 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 in that position as a Supreme Court justice, uh, how well did you know the, the other justices on the court initially? Uh, I, I didn't. I, I knew them a little bit from judicial conferences, uh, you know, but I'd only hadn't been on the Court of Appeals that long, and so I didn't know them well. I knew Frank DeRota probably better than the others. Um, okay, tell us again who, who the, the, the first five, the other four when you first went on, went on the... When I went on the, when I went on the court, the two holdover justices were Justice Frank DeRota from Nashville and Justice Charles O'Brien from Crossville. And uh, Lyle Reed was elected uh, from the Western Division, and, and uh, Sissy Daughtry was elected from the Middle Division, and I was elected from East Tennessee. Okay. Uh, at that time, uh, how was the uh, Chief Justice uh, selected? It's always been selected uh, by the members of the court. Uh, and uh, what were the terms? Uh, so to speak. Well, in uh, <clears throat> in the seven so-called seventy-four court, the seventy-four to eighty court, and uh, and the next court as well, decided they wanted to split the the um, uh, terms between them. So they divided it by five, and each of them served nineteen months. And that was true of the court up until nineteen ninety, and. Um, the Futures Commission, uh, which later met in the 90s, recommended four-year terms. We didn't decide it in 90, but we decided it ought to be longer than 19 months. They, they we would not split it up among the members, and that it would be an election by the court of that person they thought that was best able to lead the court. So uh, Lyle Reed was the first uh, chief, and uh, I was the second. And well, Char I'll take that back. Charles O'Brien served for a short time, about uh, 30 days or so before he resigned from the court. And how many times did you serve as Chief Justice? Five times. And what, what tell me those years. The years were 1994 <coughs> through 2001, and then again for a short period of time in 2005. We, had, uh, we didn't have a full complement at that time of the court, and so it was that decided they needed, they wanted to have at least all the members express their, their uh, so I served again in that interim period of time before they elected uh, Justice Barker as Chief Justice. So my calculation is correct, you were Chief Justice about seven yeah, no, years? About six years. Six years, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, <clears throat> before we go into some, some procedures and cases, uh, tell us what, what, what the, the duties are uh, of Chief Justice and, 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 and the burdens. Well, well. they're internal duties <clears throat> associated with, with running, you know, the conferences of the court, uh, uh, signing cases to, to each member, uh, and that becomes interesting at times because we, some courts assign cases in advance. We never did. We always heard the argument, and we wanted each judge to be what we called a hot judge, that is, uh, to, to know all about the case. And, uh, and so we didn't assign until afterwards, and the Chief Justice did the assigning. Well, sometimes the views would change uh, from, you know, what you talked about before, and after the argument, it would change. And so what you had down for assignments would shift on you. <laughs> so, 
So you had to juggle a little bit, but that was one of the responsibilities of the Chief Justice to, to assign cases. And uh, you also run the calendar. Um, your, you know, you set the calendar up and be sure everybody's where they belong, uh, including accommodations. And, and we traveled a lot, as you know. The Constitution requires the Supreme Court to to go to each grand division, and you actually have a Supreme Court building in each grand division. And we added Memphis to that travel schedule, and then we began um, uh, the scales program, which was more extensive travel. And um, we also held the swearing-in ceremonies in each part of the state, which had not been done before. Everybody had to go to Nashville to be sworn in if you want to be sworn in before the Supreme Court. So we added that to travel across the state to do that. So a lot of travel. How much uh, additional time was required uh, to be a chief justice as opposed to? Uh, it took uh, about between 60 and 70 percent of my time to do that. And I, I did not have a some some Supreme Courts reduce the load on their Chief Justice. In fact, some do not write opinions. But I wrote a full, full, full one fifth. Um, during the period that you were on the court, uh, and that wasn't. Uh, let me let me add. Okay. Everybody did that. It not, wasn't just me. During the period that you were on the court. Uh, Tell us the effect of changes in technology, if any, on your on your duties and, and your ability to perform your, your your duties as a justice. We had uh, when we when we began, um, we one of the things we wanted to do was to computerize the trial court so that the reporting from those courts to us, uh, we'd have accurate reporting. We'd know about case loads and we'd know how cases were moving. And um, I was sent to, to Arizona to a conference about 10 days after we were first elected to, to try to learn about that and institute it. And so that, that began, I suppose, within the first year or so after uh, we were elected. We began that process, and it's still ongoing <laughs> after 16 years. We're, we're still trying to do it, and there are a lot of problems with it, a lot of complications. But it is a lot better than it was in terms of the Supreme Court knowing where it, where the caseloads are, where the problems are, and so forth. How about the the, the, the uh, workings of the court itself? Did did you go into teleconferencing as a post actual meeting sometimes? We did. Uh, I had a friend that I played tennis with, Bob Levy, who's the vice president at UT, and he they were doing video conferencing, and of course their campuses are spread across. So he told me about it, and I thought, well, you know, that'll work for us. And we, at that time, traveled to Nashville a lot just to have an administrative meeting, just to have a business meeting. So um, we, we did that, bought the equipment, and set up, um, set up a station in, in Memphis and, and Jackson and Nashville and Knoxville, and now Chattanooga. So, okay. has, that, has that been beneficial? And, very beneficial and as far as in terms of, you know, cutting the travel down. We use it for... As, as, as you're aware, we have a lot of commissions. Um, you served on uh, one of those commissions, and those commissions can now meet uh, using the video equipment. So it's a lot more, it's, it's economical. You save the travel and the meals for the members that had to come to Nashville before, and they can do it from the video. So it's also the same thing for the court. The court's travel schedule was cut down somewhat. Before we go into uh, talk about some cases and, and, uh, and other matters, <clears throat> uh, it, uh, it's well known that you you were uh, uh, involved uh, and a leader in uh, uh, changes uh, uh, in the judicial system, uh, formulation of commissions, scales program. Things of that nature, uh, progress in the in the, uh, the function of the judiciary. 
why don't you tell us some of the things of which you're most proud uh, uh, in, in that one of the, aspect? One of the things that I had a concern about with regard to the Supreme Court was uh, at least a reputation, whether it was deserved or not, that it was ivory towerish. It, it uh, had a, le a reputation with the legislature that it was um, across the street and, and never had any association with them. And of course, the legislature determine their, at least their financial fate, if not other, other things as well. So I thought that the Supreme Court ought to remove itself from its ivory tower. Uh, and more than that, that it, it, the public need to be educated about what it did. Uh, the, the Supreme Court and the other courts uh, can only survive if the public trusts the courts. And one way to engender that trust is for them to understand what we do and how we do it. So the first uh, project was cameras in the courtroom. We had a lot of opposition to that. A lot of traditionalists uh, thought that it was inappropriate. Um, and so we, we decided to do it. Florida had been the leader in that area. We decided to do a, a one-year program to satisfy the critics. Uh, after that one year, our trial judges pretty much adopted it. Uh, we had uh, probably 70 percent opposition to begin with, and after the one year, it was down to about 20 percent. We still had some holdouts, but, but uh, it worked, and uh, none of the objections were really valid uh, in, in actual practice. So uh, cameras were helpful. Uh, my vision of it was that, that uh, we would have it on cable television, and you could watch an entire trial on cable television, and some other states have that. We could never get that done in Tennessee, but we did have it uh, in some cases. It, it operated in Middle Tennessee and Nashville and some death penalty cases over there, and it was a, a very well, you know, the number of people watched it, and it had commentators, much like court television. And that's what I envisioned for the whole state. It hadn't happened yet. I hope it does, because I think it's a good, it's like watching your city council meeting or, you know, on cable television. So, um, but it was a beginning. And the other thing that was a public education was the SCALES program. And that was uh, to educate high school students about what uh, the Supreme Court did. and. So we would take our docket to counties. We had a, a uh, bench that was built, a portable bench, and we would travel to one county to another. And um, it was uh, an extensive program of pre-education. Uh, we had teachers that would, uh, lawyers that would go out to the schools. We had actual cases. We did not. Uh, you know, change the cases around or anything. There were actual Supreme Court cases that we'd ask the lawyers if they'd be willing to go to that county or that site to do it. And uh, we very rarely had anybody turn us down. And so um, we operated that program. We, we've, um, I think we've been before about 20,000 students now. And, and uh, I've even forgotten the numbers, but 35 or 40 places we've been, traveled in the last 10 years or 12 years. That's been uh, well received, I know, by everybody. I don't know anybody who yeah. is not. It won an American Bar Association right. Award for, for education. Right. Now, you've, you've uh, alluded to some commissions uh, uh, that you were uh, in, involved in instituting or starting. Uh, you want to tell us about those? Uh, well, there, uh, we, we have a number of commissions. One, uh, which was Justice Harbinson's, um, uh, he began it, uh, it was his idea, it was the Board of Professional Responsibility, Discipline for Lawyers. Uh, when I was a lawyer practicing in, in Anderson County, the discipline was local. And so if you had a disciplinary problem, you had to resolve it within the bar. Well, you can imagine the difficulties <laughs> with that tried to do that, and occasionally you would have uh, a suit brought by the Bar Association and handled by some lawyer or another for disbarment uh, when it got that severe. It was a very poor system, 
and the Board of Professional Responsibility with a, with a professional running it uh, began to investigate disciplinary problems. Uh, we have a court of judiciary which does the same thing uh, with judges and uh, if a judge has a disciplinary problem it's investigated and there's a hearing process for it. Uh, CLE, Continuing Legal Education, is another commission that was adopted and mandatory, uh, mandatory education was required for lawyers. Uh, and ethics was added, uh, an added component to that as time went by. Um, so we, we had a, a number of commissions. It seems like they expand all the time. Did any of uh, you talked about some of your background, uh, and, and particularly your, your mother's work in the, the uh, mental health field. Did that affect any of your uh, policies? or? It, it uh, it, it began, I, I guess, at Oak Ridge where I was interested in representing the Mental Health Center and also head of a mental health foundation. Um, the foster child experience uh, led me to, to form a foster care commission to, to try to, uh, uh, one of the goals was to investigate how long people were in foster care, how quickly they could be moved out. To, uh, and be adopted and, and how parental terminations could occur, uh, all that sort of thing. It, it, uh, at one time, it was a very slow process. And, and, and uh, from what I read, you still have problems with children being in foster care, shifting from one foster care parent to another one, and not adoptable. What, uh, what Williams has done here with television is a you know really mm -hmm. uh, interesting and rewarding thing. And what he's done is is to publicize uh, uh, the plight of, of kids who are are up for adoption. And uh, and as my understanding is they have a very high success rate as as a result of his programs about children who, who want to be adopted and. Uh, he was telling me a story one time about, uh, I think there were five children, and there was a real problem. They didn't think they could get anybody to adopt five children. And uh, I forgot how many applicants. He said they had 10 or 12 applicants to adopt all five of those children. For those who don't know, uh, you're talking about Bill Williams? Yes. Who, uh, very fine man, who, mm -hmm. uh, Still is with uh, WBIR, I think, mm -hmm. uh, in Channel Western. Ten, mm -hmm. at least on a part-time basis, was <laughs> a newscaster for many, many years mm -hmm. for them. Uh, I understand also that you were, you appointed commissions on, for gender and racial fairness. Is, is that correct? I, I did. Tell us uh, about that. We well, the <coughs> bar association had done a study which demonstrated that there was gender bias all across the state. Uh, and so, and although there had not been a commission investigating it, there also was racial bias across the state in the legal system. And so there, two commissions were appointed to, to look into that, to see what could be done about it. Um, and uh, those operated uh, for two or three years, reported, and uh, suggested a, a program um, and uh, I don't think the program was completely adopted, but I think a lot of progress was made in both areas. I was going to ask you, it, uh, do you see uh, there are always will be some, some, some bias and, and all that, but do you, do you think those two areas have uh, <clears throat> come a long way in, in your tenure on the Supreme Court? I think they have. Mm -hmm. I think they have. Okay. Maybe not not because of those commissions, but uh, just because of, uh, I think the commissions helped because they identified the problem and identified solutions and tried to, to uh, engage law firms and others and to okay. help them solve the problem. Uh, uh, while on the uh, court, uh, tell us about the, uh, how, how the 
collegiality of the members of the court uh, uh, and your relationship with other justices? Uh, well, it's, it's interesting. It's a five-member court, the Supreme Court is. It, uh, the Constitution of 1835 identified uh, that it ought to be five members. Uh, it's never changed. Uh, it pretty obviously, if you look at states across the United States, uh, most states that have our population either have seven or nine members. Um, and so, of course, opening the judicial article up, uh, some people think it's a dangerous thing to do, <laughs> and that's what would so that's what would be necessary to change it. So we have five members, and it is more collegial. Those people who have a larger court, uh, nine or, or more, is less collegial. They have less contact with each other. We, uh, because we're in different parts of the state. Um, we probably have less opportunity than some of the others who, who require all their justices to live in the capital. Uh, uh, Atlanta, you know, the, the Georgia uh, folks live in Atlanta, the Ohioans live in Columbus. Uh, if they want to commute from out, they can, but it pretty much they have to be there five days a week. So, And we're one of the few states that uh, has their justices scattered all across the state. Uh, do you think the, the uh, collegiality of your, with your fellow justices is important in, in the, the process? It's very important. Uh, it, it's very important to get along. Sometimes you have uh, maybe some short-term problems, but uh, in my years on the court, I thought people got along very well, and it certainly helped the process of deciding cases uh, to, to get along. In light of some recent occurrences uh, in the, the process, uh, how do you feel about the, the, the process of uh, those of selecting justices now? How's it working? Well, I thought it worked um, pretty well <laughs> up until recently. Um, and I've heard, uh, I've heard Governor Bredesen comment that he thinks the structure shouldn't be changed. At one point, I, my understanding was that he wanted to change it, but he uh, is not so interested in changing the structure as he is the, the people that are in the structure. <laughs> uh, so I hope, I think it's a good system. I think it's the best system. If you look at other states, at Ohio and Texas and the other states that have popular elections for the Supreme Court and have to raise four or five million dollars from special interest groups, our particular system looks better and better all the time. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, when, when you, at least when you, when you started in the, in the uh, Court of Appeals, that there was uh, estrangement with some of your friends. How did that uh, did that change any when you became a the Supreme Court justice became no, worse or better, it, or what? It, 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 I don't think it. Uh, I don't think it. It changed uh, that the relationship so much, but it, there were a lot more outlets for me uh, to deal with the public. Uh, uh, the Supreme Court is, a, you know, had, really has a duty and a requirement to to uh, be at functions and be go across the state and travel and and. Uh, engage the public, and so uh, that helped a lot. I know that you, you uh, spoke a lot, uh, and uh, how did you uh, like doing that? I liked it pretty well. Um, it requires a fair amount of work to, to get the speeches ready, and you have more, you're invited more places than you can go, so. But I liked it. I thought it was, again, I thought it was a part of the obligation of the Supreme Court to educate people about what we were doing and why we were doing it. Uh, did you have to write your own speeches or did you have help pretty, with your clerks? Pretty much. Uh, yeah. I wrote my own, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, the, uh, there's been some, uh, I'm on a commission you, you, you mentioned. How do you think specialization is, is working? Uh, if you want to comment on that. 
Well, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how it's working. I know very few lawyers, percentage-wise, are are, uh, are seeking to become certified. Is that? That's my that's my understanding. Um, why that is, I don't know exactly. Okay. But I don't think it's how they envisioned that it was going to work out. Okay. Let's talk about uh, uh, some of your uh, uh, cases uh, in general terms and specific, specifically. Uh, what, what do you think uh, uh, some of the most important cases uh, were decided while you were on the bench? Uh, I know the first one was McIntyre. <laughs> McIntyre was decided pretty early in our, our um, um, Pretty early in our tenure, it was a comparative negligence case. Um, the legislature had considered the question of whether or not uh, whether there should be comparative negligence, um, and uh, had not acted for a period of about 20 years. Uh, I think Justice Dorota has described in in his uh, video uh, tape uh, the process by which. Uh, we finally came to it. There had been three votes in favor of it for a fairly long time on the Supreme Court, and uh, but they had a rule that uh, required unanimous consent and on on the old what we call the old court <laughs> court before us, and uh, and we didn't. So so it came to voting on comparative negligence, and all of us were for some form of it or another. Uh, it was linking uh, liability to fault. Okay. And so McIntyre was uh, probably the most, most uh, one of the most important civil cases that was decided during that 16 years. Well, I think by far, being a practicing lawyer, uh, trial lawyer, uh, it's the most significant case uh, in, the, in the civil aspect of trial. Now, to explain uh, a little law. bit, if you were guilty, <clears throat> if you were an injured person uh, and you were guilty of any fault at all, uh, contributory negligence, you were barred from recovery. And what McIntyre did was assess the, the amount of your fault and allow recovery if you were over 49 percent, okay. I mean under 49 percent. And so it, it linked, to some extent, uh, liability and fault. The pure form of that, which we did not adopt, um, would allow you to be 99% uh, negligent and still have a 1% recovery, uh, still be able to recover for your injuries, that 1% that's left. It's my uh, perception that Initially, uh, uh, a lot of uh, people and lawyers thought that this would favor the uh, the, the, the plaintiff's bar. Uh, uh, I don't think that's the case necessarily. I, uh, when, when you did away with joint and several liability, uh, it, uh, it seemed to me it, it made the system um, better for everyone. Mm. Uh, that's my perception. It, Some it, of the deep pocket defendants went away. <laughs> right. Uh, how do you think? Uh, in retrospect, uh, uh, McIntyre is perceived now by the by the legal community as a whole. Well, I don't know how they perceive it, but I, we thought in the beginning it was a fair approach, uh, fair to both sides, not just the plaintiffs, but plaintiffs and defendants. Yeah. And I think it's worked out that way. I think it has too, overall. I'll tell us some others, uh, the most significant cases in, in, in your tenure. Well, uh, is, in is your aware there, there are five million cases a year in Tennessee if you count the traffic ones and all of that. The two intermediate appellate uh, courts handle about 2,000 a year and we take 100 a year. So everything that, that we take is an important case. It's certainly important to the litigants and uh, you're reluctant a little bit to identify what's more important than the other. If you think in terms of impact, certainly McIntyre had an impact. 
I think uh, the small schools case uh, against McWhorter, which uh, held unconstitutional the method of funding schools and required that the legislature adopt a system that would give uh, a substantial education to every child in the state and not leave any out. The former funding system uh, was based on a sales tax return, so if you didn't have a shopping center, if you were in Hancock County or some other place, you only got the money based on sales tax return. If you were in Knox County, which, which had a lot of retail activity and generated a lot of sales tax, perhaps a better example is Sevier County, uh, which has the highest return in the state, then you're a lot better off. So we thought that was a fair way to go about it, and the legislature did adopt uh, a plan, uh, which is now being changed again, uh, the so-called uh, BEP plan, but uh, there was a trilogy of cases. The last one was a school teacher salary uh, component to the BEP, which the legislature left out because they thought it cost too much. Um, and we required that to be put in. So I thought that was a very important case in terms of its impact on school children uh, across the state. Others that come to mind that you thought were most significant? Um, there are others. Um, but I think those are the two most important, perhaps. Uh, uh, one other uh, case uh, in the civil uh, realm, if you will, uh, was the Jordan case, uh, which I personally thought impacted uh, values of these wrongful death cases. Uh, you want to tell us about the Jordan case? Uh, well, I'd, I prefer not to, to get into, uh, it's, uh, maybe I mentioned in the past, yeah. uh, Supreme Court justices don't talk about their opinions uh -huh. because if you try to interpret the opinion and you have different justices going around doing it, it invariably it's going to be different or perceived as different by different people. And so if you just leave it, read the opinion, <laughs> that's what it is. And so I prefer not to talk about the language of the cases and, Very well. and, yeah. and uh, deal with the overall impact. How many, uh, how many uh, uh, opinions do you think you uh, authored in your 16 years on the court? Uh, well, my clerks say that I wrote 3,500 overall. Um, I never counted them up, so I don't know. Okay. And how many cases uh, do you think uh, uh, in that 16-year period uh, uh, did they, were decided by the Supreme Court? I don't know. Okay. I don't don't have a feel for it. There, there came a time when the the, the, the uh, rules changed, so to speak, and you did not have to to uh, decide workers' compensation appeals. Did that help? The, in, the, the in 1994, uh, we were <coughs> able to persuade the legislature to adopt workers' compensation panels, and the whole court did not have to hear workers' compensation. Up until that time, those first four years. Our docket was 70% of it was workers' compensation cases. We also had uh, some specialized jurisdictional requirements where the legislature had said we needed to hear teacher tenure appeals. And we, in one case, we needed uh, beer board appeals. And so all of that jurisdiction was removed from the Supreme Court. And we became a certiorari court, that is, a court that uh, we'll only hear something if permission is granted by the court, and so you could turn down whatever you wanted to, except for capital cases, and capital cases always had to come to the Supreme Court. Uh, <clears throat> what have been the most difficult kind of cases uh, for you to uh, decide? Death penalty cases and uh, child custody, parental termination, uh, those areas are the most difficult. How many executions have there been since uh, you won? I participated in, in two 
uh, one where there was a, a, a trial court in Nashville had, had stopped the execution. And, and so 30 minutes before, um, I had to call the warden and tell him to go ahead. Uh, and then another one that I was involved in, we called the warden and told him to stop it 30 minutes before. Uh, the Nashville, Tennessee, and did a did an a, uh, interview with us about those two cases. Sort of interesting reading. How much toll did that take on you? It was tough, not easy. You mentioned child custody and cases. Uh, why were they so difficult? Uh, well, they just you know. Um, any case involving a child, maybe it was my own experience, I don't know, but uh, okay. it was just very difficult to make the kinds of decisions you had to make. Uh, okay. you, you were interested in the welfare of that child, and, and also you knew you, that uh, some parties were going to be hurt by your decision. You uh, retired uh, recently. I did. Uh, what? Uh, brought you that decision? Well, um, I guess, I guess uh, you decide that for everything there's a season. I decided to, okay. that I was, uh, I was ready to, to do it. Uh, what I've done is to go back and sit with the Supreme Court, so I haven't really retired very okay. much. They haven't had a fifth member for the last year because of the conflict between the governor and the nominating commission uh, over the selection of the fifth one. So I've gone back four times and sat with them. Um, the Court of Appeals is shorthanded right now, so I'm going to sit with them in August. Okay. And right. I've taken a couple of trial court cases, so sort of keeping my hand in. Okay. <laughs> what, uh, how are you enjoying your retirement? I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. What are you and Pandy doing? Uh, uh, and now that you have more time to... Well, we're traveling a little more. We're going to Russia in September. Um, I've been going through rehab, had my knees replaced, so that's taken some part of it. And uh, I'm trying to get back to playing tennis, starting again. I've been playing golf, so... Okay. How, how, are you, uh, how are you liking your retirement? I like it. I do. Okay. I, li I like the mix of some work, and I don't think I would ever want to be not work entirely um, because uh, I always loved the law. You know, I thought it was challenging, interesting, something different every day, and um, I want to continue to keep a hand in that if I can. Um, are there any areas or topics that I haven't discussed that you'd like to? I don't, I don't think of any. I think you've been okay. pretty thorough. <laughs> All right. Uh, about to wind up. One final question. Uh, uh, how would you like to be remembered uh, 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 now that you've retired in the court? Uh, well, I guess other people are going to select how you're going to be remembered, but I'd like to be remembered as somebody who was fair and honest and uh, worked hard at the job. And uh, one, of, one of the things that was, was uh, a pet peeve of mine was uh, delay in the courts, and something I worked very hard at as Chief Justice. And uh, so I'd like to be remembered as somebody who, who uh, got their opinions out on a timely basis. Always thought that justice delayed was justice denied, and that you needed to do that. Well, Justice Anderson, I can tell you, you've uh, succeeded uh, in all those areas. You've been a, a great lawyer, a great justice, and uh, have done a lot to advance the uh, system of justice in our state, and we're very appreciative. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. I appreciate you taking the time, and, and uh, Barry, the Bar Foundation, taking the time to do this interview. Thank you very much.